So welcome back. Uh, I would now like to introduce you to Bridget von Holt. Bridget is a professor from Princeton University. We are very happy that she took all the long way here. And she is now uh, going to tell us a little bit about adaptive processes in non-human species. And I'm super excited because I think she investigates very interesting non-human species, which are wolves and uh, domesticated dogs. Yes. So, Bridget. Thank you. Um, so, uh, on that note, I do want to clarify, I'm mostly giving you a review of the field of ecology and evolution using epigenetics right now. Most of this work is actually not what my lab does, although I've sprinkled my work in here. I wanted to give you a breadth of topics because, that, as Daniela said, I think there are many interesting ecological processes that have been investigated using epigenetics. So some details of some of these studies, I won't know, but we can work on that together. So just as an upfront, and even though there's a dog on the title slide and it's my favorite species, it's not going to be the major focus. But I am really focused on non-human and non-model species. And um, as we've all been talking about, thinking on how our environment shapes who we are, who we become, not only in the genetic sense, but in how our genes are regulated, is really important. And many of these pictures we've already seen in the past two days. But this is becoming a very popular topic among the community. And understanding how our genes are regulated and influenced by our environment and exposure and what can be transmitted to the next generation is really important. So my take on this is actually thinking more about how a genome can respond to some sort of pressure, abiotic or biotic. And my other love in science is that of transposons. So transposons were actually one of the first features to note changes in phenotype that didn't follow a very strict genetic pattern. It wasn't known at the time what caused these great phenotypes in maize and corn. But this was also highly influenced by environment. Many of the times we talk about um, selective pressures, reproductive pressures on a genome, and how a genome can respond to that. And corn has been one of the um, systems studied, as well as Drosophila, where environment actually starts shaping the phenotype and finding that molecular mechanism. In this case, it's a transposon, which does come with epigenetic regulation. Impacting phenotype is fascinating to me. So starting from this and some of the early work done on these really incredible um, phenotypic uh, plastic phenotypes that result from some sort of environmental stress has set the ground for understanding and exploring these questions in an evolutionary fashion. And just like almost every other talk, there's got to be some flowchart here to contextualize epigenetics, especially in relationship to genetics. So you'll see that we, if we start off here in these unshaded boxes, this is a lot of the mechanisms that you've heard from yesterday and today, thinking about how genotype can impact expression, how epigenotype also shapes expression. Much of this we really want to understand as it connects to a functional trait. So that's my first colored box up there, even though it's called box number two. We want to think about how functional traits can be shaped by any molecular mechanism. But in my case, I want to take this into an environment and ask, how does a functional trait, um, is it, how is it exposed to ecological interactions, which is now my first box over here, in which you can allow natural selection to begin working on that phenotype. And as we go through the natural selective process, that now, again, comes back in full circle and shape those molecular mechanisms. So what I'm going to talk about today are these three colored boxes. We want to think about how epigenetics shapes phenotype. We want to give it an environmental or um, ecological context, and then think about the evolutionary potential. So I'm going to present a series, just snippets of studies, that hopefully elucidate each one of these three points and try to bring this together in an evolutionary context, even though evolution and epigenetics is still quite challenging. So we're going to start off with placing our epigenetics in an environmental context and see when can we shape the environment and see um, correlated changes in epigenetics and what does this tell us about the potential for transmission through generations and contribute towards evolutionary change. 
And yet again, we all have some of these same stories. Much of what we're talking about is plasticity. Now, there are a couple different um, contexts in which plasticity are important, at least to me. We often think about how a genotype can react to an environment, and those are the graphs you see at the bottom here. Each of the environments along the x-axis, we can begin observing how a genotype responds to. And plasticity to me has two very discrete definitions. One is, how does a genotype change within its lifetime to an environment? And this may be something of a physiological change. In addition, we want to know how consistent can that genotype um, interact or respond to an environment over evolutionary time, so across generations. Many times you want to control for any genotype variation, so we have clonal species or some experimental constraint, that, constraint where we're exposing a single genotype to an environment, or we can have each of the three possible genotypes at a biallelic locus. And then record, are we measuring these parallel changes over time, where we have this nice plastic response, or is there an interaction now between the genotype and the phenotype, where you have some unpredicted or unexpected changes? So when we're talking about wild systems, which is everything that I work on, many of these um, controls that we desire are really hard to obtain. And when we think about what we have as a flexible um, wild system, there are a few cases in which we can manipulate a wild system to ask questions about plasticity, both within a lifespan and across generations. You have already seen this example of Daphnia, where you can raise a single female Daphnia in the presence of a predator. She will begin making offspring, though through parthenogenic methods, who have different phenotypes. So because they're parthenogenic, they are actually clones of each other, and this is a very nice definition of plasticity, that the pure presence of a predator can shape a phenotype, it lasts for a few generations, though it has some fitness trade-offs, Reproduction is far easier without this helmet, so there's a nice reproductive and fitness um, trade-off in that system, making it very um, amenable to studying plasticity. But I have a couple other examples that I also really like. Um, the top one is the blue-headed wrasse. This is a fish system that is um, based in a harem uh, reproductive structure where there's a single male in a group of females. The male is the largest fish, that's the big blue fish here. What's really interesting is when you remove this male fish from the harem, the largest female will actually change sex to become the male of the group. And this is all based on the regulation of um, steroid or hormone production, which will then change from an estrogen-producing fish to a testosterone-producing fish. This is an epigenetic in nature. You can reverse this sex change as well. I think it's quite fascinating. It leads to a lot of really cool ecological questions, but also plasticity-based questions. The other example that I, I like very much is that of sex um, temperature-dependent sex determination. And this means that any female can place her eggs in an environment, and the environment will actually dictate the type of sex that her offspring are, or the proportion of the um, offspring that are males versus females. This is based on the, the temperature um, required for the activity of a protein called aromatase. Higher temperatures in some systems mean higher activity of this hormone, which produces higher proportion of females. So in some case, a female could choose what temperature she lays her eggs in, and this is often what um, alligators do by burying their eggs at a certain depth. But we also can think about climate change and what this means for changing, rapidly changing environments and how species might respond to this in an epigenetic or plastic fashion. But the example that I actually really love, and this um, really piqued my interest when this was published in 2012, was a study on social living um, primates. This is the rhesus macaque. And this study was done by Jenny Tung at Duke, who has a fascinating system where she can manipulate where her organisms live in a social group and measure the epigenetic response, and thus the physiological phenotype of the organism. In this case, the, um, these rhesus macaques, she's focused on just females, and they live in really great social groups with very strict hierarchy. So many of these talks that we've heard of really um, hit the highlights of stress, whether it's um, aggressive stress, or uh, physiological stress, or um, predator stress. 
Having a socioeconomic um, ranking in human uh, civilizations can be very analogous to a hierarchy in a social primate or any other social um, group living animal. In this case, as you go lower in rank in the um, rhesus macaque, you accrue a higher level of violence and a higher level of um, stress and competition from higher ranking individuals. So on the graph on the right, we see rank on the x-axis and lower ranking individuals always receive a higher level of aggression from higher ranking individuals. So essentially they're living in chronic stress as a lower ranked individual. Well, Tung and her group were really interested to understand what's the consequence of this chronic stress, as many of these talks have indicated for human work. What her group found, primarily I put up here, um, she conducted RNA sequencing and um, paired that with uh, methylation sequencing. The first effort she went through was analyzing differentially expressed genes with the RNA sequencing to identify a set of genes that were her candidates for being influenced by the social rank of these macaques. And um, out of her enriched set of genes that showed differential expression, many of them had an increased function in immunity, um, inflammation, and I'm giving you these three examples here from her paper. These genes, you can look on the x-axis with the social rank, with the higher values being the, social, the lower social ranks in the group, show overexpression of these pro-inflammatory um, T-cell um, mediated genes, so overexpression in the lower rank and low expression in the higher rank, which meant that there was a chronic sort of immune response in these lower ranking individuals who have this very high stress level. This is really great and it had some great candidate genes for them to follow up on, but what was even more awesome, in my opinion, was that she could manipulate now the rank of these females and within just switching ranks, start measuring differences in expression, pairing it with methylation. So she could really try to tackle those questions of correlation and causation. So on the right here, we have an example of individuals with certain ranks. If you have um, the main data set on the far right is the meat of her data. This is where she identified those differentially expressed genes. And we have a couple individuals in rank one and two, which were considered the highest rank. We have a middle rank and four and five were the low rank. And then there was a series of individuals that actually not only um, could be placed in different ranks within each major group, so the arrows on the left-hand side will denote where the individual came from. So we have a new top rank individual here that came from group two. And more importantly, we have dramatic changes, like a rank number two individual that came from the lowest rank possible. So she had a handful of these animals, about a dozen if I recall correctly, that had changed dramatically from the most stressed position to the most elite position. And she had a before sample and a post change in rank um, sample from blood. And she could start beginning to predict the physiological response based on what she knew in the training set and have some amount of accuracy in identifying the rank of an individual just by their um, expression profile and also by their methylation profile. Both of those tests gave a slightly different accuracy. The lowest accuracy, accuracy she had was an 80% accuracy, and it went up to about an 85% accuracy. So if you just took blindly a sample from a female macaque in this group, she could, with 85% accuracy, tell you what rank that individual was in with an immediate change upon changing of social rank. So this is not a typical experiment that can be done with um, wild systems, but it's fascinating to begin finding out how you can tease apart um, causation from correlation. As an evolutionary biologist, the next question I ask when I see these types of results are great. Let's think about what this means for her offspring and their offspring and all the generations that are descended from her. And we have seen this slide in a variety of forms already. And this makes it complicated to look at these quantitative traits from what we have been trained in a traditional genetic sense. Traditionally, if you go down to the F2s, we know very much what we can expect for genetic variation and use that to find genes linked to the trait. It makes it much more challenging in an epigenetic sense because we have this potential two or three generation exposure 
based on how you start the counts. So the um, parental generation, her female fetus, and that fetus's um, gametes. We can see this change over time, but what we really want to tease apart now are the maternal effects from true transmission, if there is such a thing we can quantify. So the maternal effects are, I think we've talked a lot about this as being a very interesting way of transmitting a phenotype, maybe not directly through gametes, but through shared environments or imprinting, in a sense, from how the, um, the mother has ex experienced her environment. One study that was recently published is on the superb starling. This is a bird species in Africa. I believe it's in Kenya. And they had a very similar question that many of you have been talking about in terms of how does a mother prepare her offspring for a highly variable environment? Or how can you best increase the fitness of your offspring if there was a mechanism to do so? They chose a superb starling in Africa because it lives in a quite variable environment. And the primary environmental condition measured is rainfall. And in Africa, this is either a life or death situation. And if you can best prepare your offspring for the unknown, then they may have a higher fitness than those that are not prepared in an epigenetic fashion. So they had um, the idea that you had to have this plasticity, which is why they were measuring epigenetics, because you're facing with an unknown environment, and you want to increase the fitness at all means possible. They measured um, not only the rainfall across pre-breeding season and post-breeding season, but also across a number of um, years for these birds, from hatchlings to adults. Granted, there's a bit of a missing data set in the middle. You don't know what they're doing every year. But across the ages of these birds, we know when they were living and how much rainfall they um, experienced, as well as if they were reproductive or not. What they found was that in the pre-breeding season, so where mom and dad are just setting up their gametes to create their offspring, that um, pre-breeding rainfall was really um, important in terms of correlating to the methylation of her offspring. But this wasn't just any offspring. She actually had a sex-biased response. She prepared her males, her male offspring, very differently from her female offspring. And in fact, if you take this further, a slide I'm not showing you, is that it depends upon what her male offspring do in the long run. Are they breeders when it becomes time for them to lay their own eggs, mate with a female to lay her eggs? Um, or are they not breeders? So there seems to be an increase in methylation of offspring, male offspring, that's very correlated with pre-breeding rainfall. This might give us a sense on how organisms deal with changing climates. But in my mind, this is a very distinct and discrete entity of cross-generational influence than actually trying to estimate heritability. And this happens to be now one of my studies. What I was able to do um, was utilize long-term, in my mind, long-term pedigree data. I work in Yellowstone National Park with the gray wolves there. They've been in the park for the past 20, since 1995, what am I up to? 25 years, I think. And um, in gray wolf terms, this means about five generations. This is a long-term data set for a wild species. And what I've been able to do in the past 12 years working with them is establish a genetic pedigree for almost all the wolves that we've collected DNA from, which is now up to 600 animals. So this pedigree is really important if you're studying trait evolution, and this is typically what we're looking at. But um, a few years ago, when we were um, starting on methylation sequencing, this seemed like a really great opportunity to try to contribute to the community on the information on heritability of such a marker. So what we had done was utilized um, all of our pedigree information. And I show you just two packs here that have some amount of pedigree relationships. They're represented in a single year um, snapshot. The individuals that are shaded out have already died, are no longer a part of the active population. But we now have nice parent-offspring trio sets. That makes it really crucial to estimate heritability across multiple generations. And we did this with a, a typical variance component model. We were able to establish um, a simple model, which just looked at additive genetic additive epigenetic variants across um, related individuals, but we also then could include environment, so shared um, environments from the same litter, 
or shared environments across generations where litter mates were not all, siblings were not always litter mates, um, which is a nice system when you have, uh, so like monogamy versus very um, complex pack structures. In this case, two individuals were the only breeding individuals for a number of years. And at about 12 months of age, pups will disperse from a pack and may not ever actually see their litter mates. So we can control for this in our pedigree when we're estimating the transmission stability of an epigenetic mark. So we have these two models. The model number one is just simply the additive, genetic vari additive epigenetic variance. And then the second model, we can include dominance, which is when you have that deviation from an additive epigenetic model. We started off with about 24,000 cytosines from our reduced representation by sulfite sequencing. And we um, looked at this in about 30 animals with complete pedigree information. We first wanted to identify how many of those methyl marks had, um, were variable. So we came up with about 4,500 cytosines that had non-zero variants. And of that, we could identify which ones had significant values for inheritance across generations. And we come up with just about 2,000 of them. Now, when we expand our model to include this dominance factor and shared environment, we have these values on the bottom row. Again, we start off now with the non-zero value number of sites from the top, 4,500, and do the same process and identify in a more complicated model how many of these sites are significantly um, transmitted or consistent across generations. These values don't necessarily mean a lot to me, so we translated those into heritability estimates, only focused on the last numbers here. So when we transform these models now into narrow and broad sense heritability, what we see in this data set as a per site estimate, now this is very distinct from looking at differentially methylated regions, which actually are functionally more important most times than just a differentially methylated site or a single cytosine that what we have in this data set is that almost 80% or so of our cytosines show very little to no levels of heritability. We have only about 10% that's in the highest category of heritability, with another 10% in the middle of intermediate. So this means that we have to think about what types of markers, epigenetic markers, we're using when we want to start looking at transgenerational transmission and the potential to contribute to evolutionary change. So now when we think about um, linking this to a phenotype, we want to really see where these epigenetic marks can influence a trait. And we've seen a number of systems already where you can have nice experimental manipulation. If you can do this with your system, this is fantastic. I cannot do this with a dog. I cannot do this with a caribou. But you can do this with some systems, and it's, I, I'm so envious when I see someone that can do this or when I have the opportunity, I'm overjoyed to really manipulate across generations how these individuals are exposed to certain selection gradients, environmental data, and then follow up with both genetics and epigenetics. This is typically outside the realm of a wild system. The other thing which I find fascinating is utilizing crosses. And I'm showing you one of the most bizarre crosses <laughs> that you can come across. There are nice experimental um, crosses done between zebras and horses where you get a great hybrid. And many of the questions I ask are how genomes function in a hybrid environment. So when you have these divergent genomes come together and ask it to function, there are two types of things that could happen. It could function just fine. It'd be really interesting to know how is this actually happening. And the other end of the spectrum is you have this terrible, unfit organism who has mismatched genomes and it can't produce a product for the life of it. I also really want to understand hybrid incompatibility. But this is not always feasible, though we have already seen a number of studies where you can cross your organisms of interest. Um, what, what I have done is picked out from the literature, I think, some really interesting examples one of them is in plants. Again, if I did my life over, I would be a plant geneticist. It's so much easier. <laughs> I'm envious of plant geneticists. This was a study that also piqued my interest. This was um, also from 2012. I thought that was a good year for ecological epigenetics. So this is an example of, um, this is a little plant, a pincushion plant, which is a perennial, 
And it's amenable to, to both um, selfing and outcrossing. And the whole body of literature that discusses hybrid incompatibilities or outbreeding depression, we have this great big black box that we don't really know what happens when you have an inbred organism, some deficiency in the genome that reduces fitness. So this ex experiment was an attempt to try to understand the molecular mechanisms of that reduced fitness in an outbred or here an inbred um, organism. So they created two lines of this pincushion plant, a selfing line and an outcrossing line, and simply measured in this big bar graph here the level of genome-wide methylation. This was before they had an option to map any genes to a reference genome, so this was just purely a genome profile, and found a significant trend in increased methylation in an inbred organism. Fascinating to me. They also paired this with some phenotypic data. A lot of it's functional. We have, if you just look on the left-hand side, it says control. There are four phenotypes here. They measured time to bolting, which is a reproductive stage for a plant. Um, the number of leaves, the biomass, and then the photosynthetic efficiency. And the, the outbred is the light gray, and the inbred is the dark triangle. And you'll see on most traits, there's a depressed trait in the inbred line. Lower efficiency, lower biomass, lower, fewer leaves, and no difference in the bolting time. And experimentally, what they tried to do to connect this genome-wide methylation level to functional impact was to then raise some seeds in a methyl inhibiting agent. And that's what's on the right hand side of this graph. And the idea was if this high level of methylation was actually deleterious, if you could rescue it and reverse that and recover the original wild type phenotype, you may have a connected link. So the phenotypes now of the um, uh, treated individuals to reverse the inbreeding event, as well as the controls to ensure that you're not just treating your treatment, you have the same trait measurements, and for almost every, actually every one of these phenotypes, we've rescued the wild type. So there's some connection here that can be made, and uh, inferred from how methylation may act in, a, in an inbred genome. Another type of crossing is that of two different phenotypes. This is a great example of trying to understand migratory behavior in a single species of trout. This species is represented by two types, two morphs. There's a residence morph called the rainbow trout. This one does not migrate. The one on the bottom is a steelhead trout. This is a migratory or a smolt form. There are phenotypic and behavioral and physiological differences between these two forms of the same species, yet they also, importantly, can freely interbreed. So there isn't reproductive isolation they can exchange genes. So one mechanism of what shapes these two divergent phenotypes would clearly have to include an epigenetic influence. So what they were able to do, also very fascinating, is take their resident and smolt, or the, the resident and the migratory type, create an F1 and also create an F2. And from this, they could track these changes in phenotype as well as epigenotype in each of these crosses to identify differentially methylated sites. And that's what this heat map shows here, that you can identify with a series of sites those that are resident, the green bars, from those that are migratory in the blue, and there's a whole slew of genes that are hypermethylated in one form and a different set of genes that are hypermethylated in the, um, the migratory form. And many of these genes have to do with energetics, body size development. I have to look at my notes because I'm not familiar with fish genes at this point. Circadian rhythm pathways. And, it, and for example, if you pull out one of these candidate genes that has a differential um, methylation profile, you can identify the migratory from the resident very cleanly across the base pair of this gene. So this is the NHLH2 gene which is responsible for, I should be body, sorry, here we go, um, body weight and energy availability in, um, in this fish. That there's differential methylation. The resident has overall a much higher profile of methylation. The smooth line is the average. And the um, migratory kind with the red line. 
So these are great examples of identifying a candidate gene which allows for follow-up studies um, and potentially really tracking the phenotype because we have this cross um, in place. Another example of using um, very designed crosses to explore phenotype is in behavior, and this is a great tit. This one has been experimentally um, bred for two divergent phenotypes. And um, the focus on this was exploring new and novel environments. So when you present a great tit to an environment, it can either be a slow explorer or a fast explorer. And um, these researchers bred for four generations the slow explorers and then bred for four generations the fast explorers to get these divergent um, lines. They then utilized the candidate gene approach to explore what's the methylation profile along a dopamine receptor, DRD4. This gene has been chosen because of all of the functions it's involved in, which makes for a great candidate for exploring novel and new environments. And they had an outline on which parts of the gene that they surveyed. Um, there's a few exons and intron boundaries that they surveyed. Those are denoted by the letters A and B and C and D. So they looked at the CPG islands in these regions of the gene and basically asked where are the differences between the fast and the slow explorers. When you plot this across the four regions they surveyed, there were a lot of very similar methylation profiles, far more tightly when you get into the core of the gene, but there were two, only two site, two CPG islands here that showed um, significant differences between the two forms. Here they're um, suggesting that this is a transcriptional start site difference that could differentiate the behaviors of slow and fast. I clearly think that there's a lot of other questions that stem from this, but just having the beginnings of understanding what you're looking for, I think that this project has really opened up some possibilities. Um, so in my last few minutes, I want to um, try to contextualize this in terms of evolution, which is the far more challenging part. So in the evolutionary sense, there are two sort of discrete and overlapping definitions of epigenetic adaptation in my mind. One is that we're just looking for something that has transgenerational stability. Um, we may not fully understand the mechanism, but by finding these patterns consistently from parent to offspring could maybe help us understand the role of epigenetics in some trait. The other um, aspect which cannot be ignored is how much epigenetics actually promotes a genetic adaptation or genetic accommodation and how much of the epigenotype should and is, be, is linked to an underlying genotype. So independence of genotype or dependence. And when I think about this, it's more in terms of a population genetics framework. So you'll have to excuse me for that. But when I, I start thinking about how populations and their genetic diversity are exposed to strong selective pressures and may be um, rapidly changing um, environmental pressures, how does a genome deal with this? And in the epigenetic context, there are a few features we think about. One is that when you are devoid of genetic variation, we then can really try to tease apart how much expression or regulatory changes promote new phenotypes in which selection can act upon. And in this case, if we're selecting for a large size in a plant, hopefully we can see that that's transmitted across generations, which provides some evolutionary potential when you have a lack of genetic diversity. However, there's also this concept that you can't forget that epigenotype may be linked to an underlying genetic feature. In this case, we're talking about my favorite, which are transposons, which can both be a genetic and epigenetic consequence for trait evolution. But yet we have a molecular feature that influences where these little epigenetic marks are, which may result in a similar phenotype and also um, can be shaped by natural selection. So what are the mechanisms of transmission across generations and our expectations? They're still very fuzzy for a wild system, though we do know what it means to have transgenerational stability or heritability. And we have to remember there's two different cell types that 
um, you can collect. We are talking about mitosis in many cases where cells, as been mentioned, cells have to maintain their identity, they have to have their tissue-specific epigenetic marks to help them maintain whatever cell type they are, which is transmitted during cell um, replication. But we also have to think about gametes and how gametes carrying their marks are transmitted and influence um, the new genome upon fertilization in a whole, oops, other hand, a whole new organism. So we have to see this transgenerational stability in order for evolution to really help shape some of these um, influences on phenotype. And there's been many flowcharts published. I chose this one because it had um, some more details for us to think about. But we have to start asking ourselves when we have epigenetic data, what can we learn and how can we go through some of these decision trees to determine what's the potential of a mark to add to evolutionary change. Many times we can de designate something that is not heritable, shows no variation, or can explain some of the trait that we've measured. Specifically, whether or not we have an underlying genotype that can um, predict that epigenetic pattern, and what this means for long-term evolutionary stability. Are we looking at linkage disequilibrium, either between the epigenotype and the genotype, or between epigenotypes? Or have there been complete disassociation between all of these marks and we're looking at potentially something that's controlled or influenced by environment? We also have to remember the mutation rate. We have a lot of expectations that are clearly outlined for starting from some phenotype, and this top row is showing us genetic mutations. We know genetic mutations are typically um, slow relative to epi mutations. We can see very progressive changes sometimes in some type of evolutionary change. But when we think about epimutations, these have a much higher mutation rate, which is good and bad in terms of evolution. I think it's a huge bonus where we can explore this diverse phenotypic space, and hopefully something that's heritable and something that's repeatable can be shaped by evolution. But yet you still can have a lot of homoplasy because you have this high mutation rate and trying to tease apart the underpinnings of that is challenging. So I'm going to leave you with just a couple examples. I think I am running out of time. Um, this example I thought was fascinating. Um, the authors used darter fish to try to address the question of essentially what is the process of speciation? Do you first get genetic divergence or do you first get epigenetic divergence? And they were hypothesizing that among very closely related populations who are locally adapted, you can expect that epigenetics will show more variation because you have this very dynamic environment of a closely related species. Mutations will take too long, but epimutations may contribute to this local adaptive um, process. And they utilize darter fish, which have very nice um, sexual selection. So males are the really ornate individual of the group, and females get to choose their mates. There are populations, uh, they explore two river basins in Maryland, these triangles and these circles. Each population um, experiences reproductive isolation and has different phenotypes that you can identify based on how the females have selected the males. They chose some fin clips and conducted an MSAP, which is just a restriction enzyme digest for methylation. They recorded methylation profiles of each of these populations, as well as the genetics. So the genetics, I have to give a cautionary word here, because the genetics was just simply the presence or absence of the restriction enzyme site. And this can be very um, uh, non-informative. However, it's still very intriguing. So what they did was measure um, both genetics and epigenetics on these populations, and they made hybrid crosses. They looked at behaviors of hybrids, viability of hybrids. They did the whole thing. What I found astounding was this plot, where they looked at basically population structure in using epigenetic marks, the top row, compared to genetic structure, the bottom row. You don't see any genetic structure. I'm not sure I'm entirely surprised, but what you have is really clean epigenetic profiles that, that reflect demography here. So the authors 
interpreted this in a context that epigenes and their variation will help shape a very plastic trait before speciation or high level of divergence can be reflected in the genome. And they parsed out now many traits of these populations to understand how, which feature best explains those traits. Does epigenome explain differences in behavior, differences in reproduction, or do genetics? So they did this nice um, variance model to, uh, along with their p-values to identify what can better explain ecological isolation, behavioral um, uh, isolation, incompatibilities, and they identified that the only significant um, relationship was between the epigenetics and the behavioral, uh, 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 sorry, behavioral isolation. Now I think that there's a lot of bounds. Uh, we have to be careful on how you interpret this, but it's intriguing and it could provide a lot of information for other systems. So they said that epigenetics better explain behavior um, and that this can contribute towards the speciation change. Okay, in just two minutes, I'm going to go through some canine work really briefly. We can just skip all the dog pictures, right? <laughs> so I study dogs and wolves, and we've looked at the genes that contribute to their divergence, our little domestic dog on the right. We look at the phenotypic differences between dogs and wolves, and it's a vastly different organism. Our gray wolf here is very standard, very few differences in the traits among wolves. Dogs represent a cornucopia of flavors and behaviors and, and vari uh, variations. Methylation data on dogs and wolves has revealed that also we can identify species differences which, to be honest, I actually didn't expect it to be quite um, obvious, but we have all of our wolf data on the left-hand side of principal component one, and all these dogs are on the right. They're squished up mostly on um, component one with a lot of variation on component two. There isn't really a trend on component number two, um, but I really enjoy the separation just from methylation data and no model assumed, just a component analysis. When we do go through and ask what's differentially methylated between dogs and wolves, everything above this dashed line is considered good enough for statistical purposes. And I've highlighted some features of these outliers. And if you note, many of these are residing within lines and signs or retrotransposons. Again, some of my favorite features. So what we're really talking about here potentially is that a large fraction of my data set shows a genotype influence over methylation patterns. We can very easily imagine the epigenetic control of um, retro elements where they're inserting into a genome, which is different from a genotype, a transacting factor, which might influence in a mutation of a methyltransferase, might influence the activity of your methyltransferase. So we still have a genotype factor we have to consider. And I just show that again in this slide, that out of all of these outlier sites, which had passed our statistical significance, over half of them were retrotransposons, LTRs, signs, and lines, and they were hypermethylated in dogs. And we can make a story for that as much as you want. The last two slides I have are to show now a separate experiment, which we were able to be a part of, where um, some organization decided to hybridize a gray wolf with a coyote. Um, I won't go into the background, but we were able to obtain a couple, six F1s, and then there were two F2s produced. Um, this was um, an incredible opportunity to pair genetics with epigenetics. I did all of the ancestry mapping and paired that with epigenetics, and we find that the epigenetic profile can cleanly designate, here is our coyote individual, over on the right-hand side in a principal component, these are the, uh, the wolves that were the potential sires in this cross. There were multiple pairs made. And then the F1s and F2s have a great intermediate methylation profile. And in going through a regression analysis, we find that ancestry can also very strongly predict methylation patterns in a hybrid genome. Oh, sorry, my last slide. This is a shout out to twins because I'm a twin. <laughs> And it wasn't my motivation to ever do genetics, but it makes for a really great story. Um, there are so many unknowns when we think about changes in phenotype, what our environment um, contributes to that, and everything that we don't know, especially in wild systems. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. I do have 14 minutes for questions, so I feel pretty proud of myself. <laughs>
So thank you for having me. Thank you, organizers, very much. I like the twin slide. I'll keep it there. Also, thank you, Bridget, for giving this very nice talk and also thank you. Um, giving this very nice overview um, about adaptive epigenomics in various monument speeches. So that was a very interesting to me, which models you can all use to investigate yeah. that. And also, of course, into your own research um, and also the nice uh, things you said about the importance or the thing with heritability, which should definitely also be considered in human studies investigating transgenerational uh, epigenetics. So, yes. Yeah. Based on your analysis uh, in the dogs, do you see any potential specific transposons in the certain different dog classes, uh, or is it just a general increase in transposons? Great question. Um, we didn't have a high enough sampling per breed to answer that. What we do know is that dogs seem to have responded to transposons in a very specific way. There are transposons that are very old and ancient and found in gray wolves. And they too would be and are methylated. We've checked a number of them. Um, so what we're challenged with is the current set, and maybe Tomas will be the answer to this, but the, currently the reference genomes that we've been working with don't um, represent the full diversity of transposon insertions. And we're limited in what we can infer from that. But if we had maybe 100 genomes from different dog breeds, that would give us a better sense of transposon diversity. Many of these questions that I have on transposons are separate, but speak to that with the idea that domestication and selection have really remobilized a lot of these elements, of course, and that they have bursts of activity. Some breeds would have more than others. But currently, I think Tomas may hold the answer to that. I've actually never asked him. Tomas, will you help me? <laughs> no. <laughs> no dogs. <laughs> yeah. I, it's been a restriction for the genome assemblies lately, but I think we're now getting to the point it's possible. Yes? OK. Uh, are there any speculations of the effect of burst in transposons? The, the timing, or what was the burst? If, if there are any speculations, what, what, what gave rise to this transposon burst? Yeah, so I would, I'm just going to point to the Drosophila and plant literature that there's been a handful of studies that do show that very strong selective pressures can reactivate transposons. For me, um, as a canine geneticist, I would point to inbreeding pressure as being a super terrible pressure that has, uh, like one of my slides, it gets rid of all your genetic variation, and yet we have really intense diversity in dog phenotype. Granted, we've mapped a handful of these really great traits to mutations. I think there's still a lot left to explore for how these phenotypes are generated and regulated, and I suspect Somewhere along the dog lineage, we had a massive explosion of transposons. But that is still just my pie in the sky. Would love to see that. Yes, Axel. But is, is, it, is a larger percentage of dog genome transposable animals, or generally compared to, let's say, the cat? Or? Um, no, it's, it's comparable to human. I don't actually know what cat have for content. Um, but it's quite similar to humans. We have. Uh, Canines have a number of families that are just prolific in the genome, similar to ALU elements in humans. So it, it's, been, it's been cataloged. There's some work a few, you know, 10, 15 years ago to give some percentages, but um, not necessarily compared to wolves, nor has it been exhaustive. So it, it's still, I think, about a 30, I think it's about a 30 percent, though I'd have to check my number. But I guess then you would say it's, it's it would be a good idea to follow up on this and resequence those genomes with long yes. breeds rather than yes. the short breeds where you would mix them and filter them out. Yes. There are a number of short, there are a handful of very short transposons that we've been able to sequence just fine um, with short read technology, but absolutely, many of them are going to be much longer elements. We need longer reads. Again, I think we should blame Tomas. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think as many more dog genomes come online um, and have either de novo assemblies or long reads, that would be really useful to looking at this in a very robust way. <laughs>
So is domestication something like fast evolutionary change, but directed? I mean, I'm trying to think if you, if you were to widely speculate, what other mechanisms that uh, again and again are used in domestication in plants or animals or different kinds of animals? Would you yep. argue that these are the same things that are selected for that happen to domestication? Yes, yes. So it's very targeted directional selection. For most organisms that are not plants, we're talking about very strict changes in reproduction and behavior. Behavior is a very strong pressure to turn anything that you handle into a, a tame, docile organism. For sure, but what happens yep. on a molecular level? Well, yeah, so there's this domestication syndrome that is su suggested to have the same molecular foundation. And there's a few hypotheses as to what are those molecular underpinnings. And many of those have targeted, uh, conceptually targeted, very high master switches in a functional pathway that you change one gene and you have all of this great linked functional changes which lead to the same suite of phenotypes among a variety of domestic species. And some of these genes have been alluded to, um, but much of it is still in, in discovery mode. I think people want to find genes for behavior but there's also a number of genes that have been mapped for the physical changes in canines and cows and sheep and pigs that have very similar um, underlying molecular mechanisms or molecular changes linking that phenotype. But finding that one gene that's found in the same you know, mutated fashion in all domesticates has not, has not been found, though cross-species comparisons have been done. It's, you know, it's a, I've graded out for you. <laughs> Was there another question? Did you? Yes, well, um, just so you showed this uh, hypermethylated uh, Yes. But sorry, I don't understand. What's, does it mean they are more active and there's more transposition or the opposite? It's the opposite. So hypermethylated transposons are usually the shutdown mechanism. Yeah, so we see that in dogs there's more methylation of these transposons. And my hypothesis, as um, we were discussing, is I suspect that these were recently active and recently targeted. Recent being in terms of evolutionary history, that there was a burst of activity since domestication, but this is just my speculation. Cat questions? <laughs> <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I wasn't serious. <laughs> so, when, I, when I think back about yes. the, you know, the new rise of epigenetics, I think yes. the plant field yes. for once was ahead of the zoology field. Abs yeah, absolutely. And so what's different about plant, plant molecular biology that allows this or that maybe leads to different molecular or evolutionary mechanism compared to animals? Not in a do are you talking about domestication or just in general? Just in general. Just in general. Um, well, I think there's more variation in epigenetics in plants. Um, it occurs at uh, the other motifs that you see, the CHH, CHG, and the CG, um, have, it's far more well known what those motifs are doing, and the functional connection has been easier to work out. In mammals, we see less variation, and I think on the whole, it's harder to work out. I don't work in mice or really a lot of cell lines um, or fish. So it's, I think, been quite limited as to what you can turn from a wild species to look at the, the diversity of mammals into a functional, uh, a functional model. And plants are, are just phenomenal. I told you at the beginning, I want to be a plant geneticist if I were to do it again, because that's, you have all these key resources. That's nothing Well, I mean, we don't have leaves or stems. I'm sure there's something very inherently different, but in terms of, I mean, there's a few differences in how the methyl transferases work, but I don't know that that's the key secret on why we know more about epigenetics in plants. I just think that it makes a much better model system and experimental system in the long run. But, yeah, I mean, I don't... I, I, yeah, anybody else with plant? You're a plant geneticist. Fun Katie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and it differs so much between plants as well that 
whatever we know in Arabidopsis may or may not tell us much about, so, yeah, something else. It's just easier to manage and manipulate and generation time and growing and no protocols and ethics questions. And what? You should trace the evidence. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, yes. I think there may be some more to discuss um, also during the lunch time. Okay. If, if that would be okay because um, lunch starts uh, soon. Okay.